Hello, and welcome to another episode of Solipsis Watched. I'm your host, The Social Solipsist, and this week I watched The Secret of Nim from 1982. Uh... This movie has been on my list for a long time. It is one in a very long list, as I've mentioned before, of movies that a lot of people I know have had, uh, like, childhood associations with, uh, and I never saw for one reason or another, mostly just having a very limited media access as a, as a kid. So I never saw this movie. However, it came up most recently, um, just a few days ago, in a conversation about um, childhood movies of a certain era that traumatized the kids that watch them. <laughs> Which I feel like I could spend quite a long time talking about those movies, and I'm sure if you're near or around my age, there's a pretty good chance you have a few of those of your own. Because uh, uh, making media for children is a, a weird process, and I've only gotten kind of good uh, in you know the last fifteen twenty years, maybe I'm gonna say maybe a little longer. It's been a it's been a bumpy ride for kids, <laughs> um, and this is a whole can of worms that I didn't expect to open. Um, this this my my background on this was actually thinking that this was a much more popular movie than it seems that it was and we have to kind of talk about production and the era that it came out in and the people who were involved with it in order to really talk about it properly because i know i've heard uh, quite a number of people over the years talk about this film but um in even trying to look up information about this movie, the Wikipedia page for it, for example, is incredibly sparse. Possibly the sparsest uh, Wikipedia entry for anything I've watched on this series. Maybe not, but it's certainly very close. It looks like the kind of Wikipedia article you'd have, you would have seen 15 or 20 years ago, where it's not very filled out it's got a lot of red links and it is not up to wikipedia's standards of writing um that to me tells me that not not a lot of people are looking it up and not a lot of people are re revising it and i didn't look at the change logs for the the article but that to me tells me something at least about um people's interest and knowledge of this film which is interesting given the number of people I feel like I've heard talk about it. Now, it's not a super it's not super popular compared to a lot of the other movies, animated movies that came out in the 80s and then the 90s certainly um, going into the Disney Renaissance, but that gets into a whole topic about um, the history of animation in in uh well, specifically in the United States and um, throughout the 70s and 80s and beyond and who was involved in that. And I'm not going to go into super high depth here, but I want to focus on one particular thing here, which is that the, the director and writer, Don Bluth. Don Bluth is a very well-known name and one of the arguably one of the greatest innovators and most influential people in um, American animation over a very long period. And he initially worked at Disney for quite a few years. I believe this is the first movie that he worked on after having left Disney. He left in, I think, 79, maybe? I was just looking this up. Um, and... That is after having quite a lot of influence over um, some of the the production stuff that was happening there at the time, but not so much given credit. Uh, it's more in anecdotes after that it, it was implied that he had such a dramatic um, influence. And his main reason for leaving was primarily because he wasn't given the or, or is stated that he wasn't wasn't really given the leeway he wanted the artistic control that he wanted 
This is really interesting because, especially of the Disney Renaissance of the late 80s and, and into the 90s, um, when Disney would put out some of its most popular and most successful animated movies. And in a lot of ways, you can see the influences of, I think, can be, that I think can be credited to Don Bluth and um, the people who worked with him uh, in those movies, but many, many years later. Don Bluth left Disney with a, a number of other Disney animators and founded his own company. And this is the first movie again. Again, I'm pretty sure this is the first movie they worked on at the new production company. Um, and really shows off incredible animation talent, uh, ability to draw um, dynamic characters, beautiful scenes, great use of uh, color and light and darkness and um, very impressive sort of uh, uh, visual effects. I don't really know how to explain it super well. My 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 animation technology knowledge is not and, and technique knowledge is not that high, but it looks fantastic. And Don Bluth is primarily known for having these incredibly vibrant and impressive. Um, products attached to his name that said historically and he, he's still alive now he's quite old now but um he has not had very much commercial success uh, throughout his entire career he seems to have been cursed to be dealt a series of really bad hands um and while he has definitely made a name for himself and will probably go down in history for for his accomplishments um the things that he produced largely did not go, uh, do very well. The the one the, there are a few things that did better, sort of in the '90s, but um, this the lack of success for this movie is primarily credited actually to uh, having to compete against E.T., which released about the same time and was such a blockbuster hit for kids movies that like there was no way it was going to compete with it um that said immediately after um spielberg the director of et would then ask don bluth to um work on was it the rescuers i believe um that uh that they would produce together with an, in a new a new production company of their own um sometime later and that would do better than than this but um it, it's a whole interesting saga of him having a lot of very notable productions that often did not do very well same goes for um um what's the name of it is it dragon's quest i believe which was a hand animated uh, arcade game that then got ported um a couple of times and got some uh, remakes and things and sequels that didn't go so well. We don't, we don't talk about those, but it's an incredibly impressive um, thing to see now. If you ever go into an arcade and see um, a, a cab running that game, it is still visually stunning to this day. Now, as a video game, it's a little bit weird. It's, it's, it's a, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a choose your own adventure, but with failure points and it uses, you know, credits credits like an arcade machine because it wants to make money it's a whole thing but it's a fascinating experiment um and what's interesting I, i'm bringing this back around i swear what's interesting about uh that is that not that long ago they uh, don bluth and some folks tried to crowdsource money to make a full feature length movie made from that game essentially to make it from like i think it's like a 15 it's like 15 minutes of of animation um in that entire game um and they wanted to make it into a feature like length th of thing that would um extrapolate on the background of the characters and the overarching story um rather than solely focusing on the most largely the most impressive and bombastic parts of it which was really the um the attract mode of the of the arcade cabinet and the the core gameplay loop of the, the arcade cabinet was wanting to see what the next scene looked like um 
that's interesting to me because this movie ends up falling into a similar trap where despite being a full-length film and ostensibly targeted at children, I don't think it has a strong story. Or at least it has one that's kind of confused. And despite so many things that are really good about this, I come away from it feeling kind of middling on the subject. Um, it has, like I said, incredibly impressive animation that looks incredible even today. Um, and some genuinely great scenes and some very good music and sound editing um, and some truly like kind of, I don't want to say horrifying or terrifying, but it's some definitely quite a few scenes that would um, strike strong emotions into a child and to a lesser extent into an adult. Um, the arc of the story sort of loses the plot. And this became more interesting to me reading up on the fact that this is based on a novel or a, a, a story. I don't know if it's technically a novel. It is. It's 233 pages. It's not short. Um, from 1971 that it follows relatively closely. Um but makes some key divergences that I think are bizarre and sort of harm the story overall. The I'm going to avoid spoiling too much until a specific point where I'll I'll mark it, but the the overall arc is or the overall story is relatively simple um it's and and it is not what seems to be advertised of this movie if you've never seen this movie but you've seen clips from it or something like that you've probably seen one of the various most um most impress visually impressive clips and those are often the fantastical elements of the story and in fact, going into this originally, I assumed that the it was a essentially a fantasy movie. And it sort of is, but it mostly isn't. And the fantastical elements are almost completely unique to this adaptation, as far as I can tell. They seem to be completely absent from the original the original um, book. That would be sort of weird enough, but it doesn't lose it, it it continues in the same mostly the same plot as the original story, but seems to have taken this um, fantastical tangent in order to um, probably cater to what it assumed was, uh, a particular audience interest for animated films of the time. Um, this was, again, pre-Disney Renaissance, but it is during an era when there were still a substantial number of animated films for kids on the market, and a lot of them were um, various forms of, it was, you know, uh, either it's animated animals, it's um, fantasy and... and um, what do you call it? Uh, like sort of medieval setting type of stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's very sort of, it's fantastical all around in one, one flavor or another. The original story, the original book story leaves that completely absent and seems to sort of, I don't know if it's trying to make it more childish or not, but it, I don't know. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit like if you took Charlotte's Web. There's there's so many other... I'm, I'm not even going to draw that specific comparison, but it, there are a bunch of other uh, like books, full-length books written for children that I, can, I could cite where you could add a fantastical element, but you don't need to. Where the um, 
unreal elements of the story don't need to be explained in such a way or put with such bombast that they that it's assumed that there's like a magical a truly magical element you don't read charlotte's web and ask why the animals can talk you don't um and that's sort of where the plot gets lost i'm getting really close to talking about it so i'm just gonna like skim over the the rest of the like the the non-plot elements i want to talk about which is um primarily that the I, i guess related the script sometimes leaves something to be desired it's it sort of jumps around kind of a lot some of this i think is a an element um, that comes from the disconnect in the different parts of the plot. But some of it is just sort of questionable writing that could have used another pass, I think, for continuity. And kind of even more disappointing than that is the variety in the um, the animation uh, voiceover performances. This is still, it's it's 82, it's not an era where um, animation voiceover is so prevalent that standards are so high, but it's late enough that I think there are some performances here that are very underwhelming, including from some notable um, actors of various eras. This includes a whole bunch of actors from... Um, who who were you know well into their into their late age at the time this came out, um, who put on far better performances than this in other animated things and certainly in other live action things for those who were actors before most of which were, um, but it is a pretty star studded cast and has often some underwhelming performances. And especially that hurts it when um, it is one good performance contrasted against one underwhelming one or one bad one. Um, There are some characters who pretty consistently are doing an excellent job. There are some that vary between scenes or even between lines. And there are some that are just sort of overall underperformed, I think. And especially when... Bluth and his company, um, their animation style is very, um, it's very animated. It is constant movement. It is very um, emotional. The, the, the type of animation they do gives a lot of physicality to the characters that should be reflected in their voices. And when it doesn't match, it's more jarring in that respect. And it, it becomes underwhelming as a result. Um, just to step back for a second, I think one thing that is particularly interesting is that pretty much nobody I have talked to about this movie or heard about this movie from would have seen it in, in theaters, which checks out because it did very poorly in theaters. It made its money back, but that not by a large margin. Um, and it seems to have largely gotten a cult following long after the fact, well into the 90s when um, VHS uh, and other recorded media were becoming, uh, having home home media playback was um, much more prevalent. And that's sort of when it was rediscovered um, or at least um, discovered for the first time by a lot of people. Um, I am not going to spoil the full plot, but I want to talk about some of the fantastical elements here. So if you want to skip that or you want to watch the movie, then um, I would say go ahead. It's it's not a bad film, but it's it's got some I've got some foibles with it, obviously. So now to talk about the the fantastical elements and the non-fantastical elements. The core plot of the film is basically about this um this widowed mouse who is trying to save her children from, um, or trying to move her children from their summer home or from their winter home to their summer home because the field that they live in is about to be plowed and the existential threat of being, of having their, their house destroyed 
um, by um, by the plow is um, becoming more a more serious threat because she can't move her youngest child because he's sick. This is a great hook. Um, what it isn't is a good through line for the rest of the plot, especially the movie version. The movie version, she essentially goes on a fantastical quest that parallels a lot of the traditional hero's journey um, to find, she, she has to seek help from various people. She has to overcome her own um, worries and concerns of her own well-being because she has something greater to strive for, that being saving her, her son. Um, and then, you know, goes through these trials and tribulations, ends up meeting this very, to, in this situation where she meets a bunch of these, I guess I have to talk about the plot. Uh, I, I said I was going to do it, so I guess I'm just going to do it. The, she meets these rats who say they were, they escaped from the National Institutes of Mental Health which is what NIM stands for, which is wild in the context of this movie, but makes more sense in the book, which I'll get to in a second. And they basically say they were experimented on and they were given like greater abilities um, by the experimentation that was done to them. And they could like, they could read and, and all these other things. And that basically never comes into play in the movie. Because while they have established this sort of like visually impressive location and culture in the space that they're in, it's not like they have, that doesn't really go anywhere. There's this handful of, of uh, rats who, who are all sort of in with this, but they are not dramatically better than any of the other um, animals that are around. Well, there are some. There's. It's a weird thing because a lot of the character, a lot of the animal characters talk, but there's a few that don't that are basically treated as dumb animals, and that's really weird. That's a whole other um, can of worms to open. Um, but that that whole arc never really comes into play. They basically come in as a uh, a means to set up an additional set of plot lines and a, an additional um, complication to her ultimate goal which is to save her home and the end the the like the climax of the movie is almost completely unrelated to that whole plot where she's essentially given a magical amulet that allows her to lift her home out of the mud just as, as it's about to be destroyed and then the movie just like ends and then they lived happily ever after and it's very weird it's a jarring transition um, and while, like, having her, especially as a female character, which even in the 80s and even in animation was still very much a rarity um, to have a female main character, um, let alone a, a widowed mother, like, that's usually even now very much not, the, not a thing, um, that is done actually very well because you have a lot of these characters who are implied to have uh, to be inherently better than her not even just because she's female or because she's a little a little mouse or whatever else um that like she has the power to protect herself and the things she cares about and does not have to solely rely on others and we could get into a whole discussion about the character agency and the problems with having it be um sort of uh obfuscated by the fact she has this amulet that she uses which then just magically disappears by the end of the film um but that i need to talk about in the context of the book because the book doesn't have that amulet at all the in fact the final threat is completely different rather than having their final attempts to move the home be sabot uh, be undercut um and then having to make one last ditch effort to save it on her own that doesn't happen there's no real fantastical elements um the book is much more about the 
at least from the summary that I read, I haven't read the book, um, is much more related to a kind of an interesting social anxiety, social commentary and social anxiety about, um, well, both about communities and um, insider and outsider behavior uh, and how her her needs are not met by the the powers that could help her, etc. Um, but even more so is a commentary on um, anxiety in sort of the 50s and 60s and 70s, especially about this explosion of scientific experimentation um, and some of the um, both truly questionable, ethically questionable or morally questionable um, science that was being done sometimes, and also just anxieties about imagined scientific uh, overreach, especially in the wake of World War II. And as more and more information came out about um, what various groups uh, were doing during World War II and before and after, um, scientific anxiety was not an unreasonable thing to have. But it's interesting that in terms of literature, this is one of the, f there, there aren't a, a huge number, especially for kids, of, of pieces of literature that, um, that really target that anxiety. We could get a whole conversation going as well about whether that's entirely appropriate to be bringing up to kids that, you know, giving, giving, um, making people, con making children concerned about medical practices and scientific research practices and all those other things are entirely great for kids. Um, and we could also get into an entire, you know, uh, history of science, especially in the United States, and how um, people, especially in mental health, were treated for an extremely long time and sometimes still are. Um, but that all is sort of like very tertiary to the core of the core of the plot, because ultimately the whole reason for those uh, those plot lines is to give the final conflict a means a, a means of conclusion that the these intelligent rats are finally able to get together and assist her using the knowledge that they have gained um, to use uh, mechanics beyond normal rats to move the house. It's a whole thing. And it fascinates me that they felt the need to add this fantastical element. And on the one hand, it adds some positive elements, I think, of, of giving um, the main character um, agency of her own rather than being wholly reliant on others or pr primarily reliant on others, I should say. Um, but ultimately, just sort of snaps a whole like the the main um it, it, the the main arc of the story seems to suddenly end in order to add this sort of um final climax and seems to go along with what i feel like is true of a couple of other don bluth productions which is that it's more about an individual scene and the impressiveness of that scene than the greatness of the overall production being told. Now that's hardly unique for, for children's films. It's hardly unique for animation, but it is notable. And I think it, it no matter what, and no matter the context, it is still ultimately a problem with the movie, a flaw with the movie and, and a missed opportunity to have a more focused narrative. Um, I think that's most of the things I wanted to say about it. It's sort of like, it's still rolling around in my head. And I'm very curious how this is interpreted by people who saw it as kids, because I think the, the, visual, the, the visual appeal is very potent. 
I think the visual terror is also pretty potent. There are some scenes in here that are truly distressing to watch, um, especially if you have like medical anxieties and things like that. Um, they show in, in pretty explicit terms um, the like experimentation and uh, like genuine bodily threat at other times and, and these other things. It does not shy away from making scary scenes. And while I don't think it quite holds up to some of I don't think it's like the top of the top in terms of uh, traumatic children's movies, it certainly does it quite a, a lot. A lot of the children's movies in my mind and in people I've talked to's minds who have like, oh, you remember that scene that really messed me up? It's usually like one scene per movie, uh, maybe, maybe two, but it's usually not. This one has quite a few that I think are less severe, but more pervasive. Anyway. This is an interesting movie, and visually it's very impressive. There's a lot of things that are really good about it. Ultimately, I think it's kind of okay, and I wouldn't really recommend it to as a kid's movie, but it is a fascinating production and, and represents a specific um, sort of point in American animation history that I think is worth knowing, if that's something you want to know. So I think it's worth the watch, especially since it's, it's fairly brief, but... Um, it's it's maybe I don't have I certainly don't have the nostalgia factor that would drive me to remember it so clearly as some of the people I know who have who saw it as kids. Anyway, um, this has been uh, this has been so, what what is my outro again? Ah, uh, um, thank you for watching another episode of Solves Watched. I've been your host, the Social Solipsist, and I'll see you guys next time.